Right, guys, let's start. Okay, so today we're actually going to talk about the uh, biomembranes, the topic which is a logical continuation of what we were talking last, uh, last time. So, uh, so as you remember, last, uh, in the last lecture we were talking about the lipids, and uh, so as a very diverse group of uh, uh, biological macromolecules, um, I mean, which basically unites the mo uh, together the molecules, which uh, the only thing that they have in common is just that they're poorly soluble in water, and uh, like usually soluble in nonpolar solvents. So, um, so and when talking about the lipids, so we were specifically talking about the structural lipids. I mean, so the ones which we refer to as uh, glycerophospholipids, sphingolipids, and cholesterol. So those uh, three main groups of lipids. I mean, that we were uh, talking last time, uh, but last time we were talking mainly about ah louder. Okay, let me maybe. Well, is it better now? Okay, because here it's almost at the maximum. Okay, I'll, I'll just bring it close. Okay, so um, last time we were talking about those lipids mainly from the chemical uh, and structural point of view. Today we're going to be talking about them from the functional point of view. So, and I briefly mentioned them, uh, those uh, lipids such as glycerophospholipids, cholesterol, and uh, uh, sphingolipids form biological membranes. And today, we're actually going to focus on these biological membranes. OK, so this is uh, chapter 11 from the Lineage of Principles of Biochemistry, 6th edition. OK, so what are the biological membranes? So I mean, perhaps I mean many of you already know what is that, because you've taken some uh, lower level, like bias 100 and 200 kind of courses, I mean, where you all covered that. But we, let's just uh, once again just go over. OK. So all cells have the plasma membrane, so which separates the interior parts of the cell uh, from, the, uh, from the surrounding, so which is extracellular matrix in the case of uh, multicellular organisms. So in addition to plasma membrane, uh, eukaryotic cells have various, uh, uh, have various internal membranes that divide the internal space into the compartments. Uh, and we will talk about the, uh, uh, such compartments as endoplasmic reticulum, uh, Golgi apparatus, uh, trans-Golgi network, sec uh, uh, secretory granules, and so on. Okay, um, so membranes are complex lipid-based structures that form uh, pliable sheets inside the, inside the cell. So, and they're composed of a variety of lipids and proteins. So that is very important uh, thing here, so that the plasma mem uh, biological membranes in general, not only plasma membrane, but any biological membrane, it's not made only of the lipids. In many cases, the uh, content, the lipid content is even less than half. So, but uh, made of lipids and proteins. So, uh, so some membranes, lipids uh, 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 and proteins are glycosylated. And we will see uh, where, where are the sites of that glycosylation. Let's take a look on the electron microphotograph of a typical uh, animal cell. So, uh, what, do we, what we can see here, it's a number of different membranes. Uh, so we can kind of see like the outer, uh, like a tiny little like line here. So that would be a plasma membrane. So we can also see the membranes of the endoplasmic reticulum inside the cell. So uh, the membrane that surrounds the nucleus of the cell is a nuclear membrane. So in there are a number of organelles such as mitochondria, for example, or chloroplasts in the case of plant cell. So that will, um, uh, that will be also surrounded by the membranes, by the biological membranes. And of course, a number of different vesicles inside the cell, such as secretory granules, for example, that are also su surrounded by the membrane. So if we were to look at a plant cell, what uh, would be conceptually different in the picture? Exactly, somebody said cell wall. Yes, so, so cell wall, I mean, it's, it's, uh, it will, uh, I mean, you would be tempted to call that cell wall a membrane, right? But it's not, it's actually very thick, very dense, uh, sort of, um, in, I mean, uh, uh, enclosure for the cell, which is made mainly out of cellulose and other polysaccharides. So on the electron microphotograph, it will look very prominent, so like very thick, uh, but it's not gonna be a membrane. So the membrane would be only the tiny little leaflet at the inner side of this uh, uh, cell wall. Okay, so what are the functions of the biomembranes? So um, to make it simple, just ask the same question, what are the functions of the 
let's say, country borders. So define the, I mean, boundaries of the country, right? Define the boundaries of the cell. Allow import and export. So basically allow something to come in and something to come out. So, so retain uh, good stuff inside and kick out the bad stuff outside. So like the same, exactly the same analogy. So um, uh, also it's important to be able to sense the external signals and transmit information into the cell. So if you, if you would be a cell, membrane would be an ideal place to install those uh, sort of sensory units like sensors. So because, I mean, so this is the part which is like the closest to the outside. And you should have some sort of an intricate system for conveying the signal inside. Um, also, uh, biological membranes provide compartmentalization within the cell. So uh, compartmentalization, basically, it's like segregation or like uh, basically having internal rooms. So it's like having the states inside the United States, right? So there is like the federal borders outside the country, right? But we also have uh, 50 uh, states inside the country, right? So the borders mainly exist on the paper, but still, I mean, so there, uh, there, there, there are some differences. So, and, uh, and the uh, internal compartmentalization of the cell is somewhat similar. Uh, uh, <clears throat> so uh, more specialized functions of the biomembranes is, for example, uh, uh, transmission of the nerve signals uh, or storage of energy as proton gradients in the case of, for example, uh, uh, bacterial uh, plasma membrane or mitochondrial membrane uh, and support synthesis of ATP. So these two functions are intricately linked together. So, uh, so what are the features of the biological membrane? So, um, so they are flat like, uh, they are flat structures which are 30 to 100 angstrom thick. So again, angstrom is a non-systemic unit of measure. So one angstrom is three to 10 nanometer thick. So an M, so the small M, that's a meter, right? So it's not uh, molar. So molar is a capital one. Okay, so main structures, uh, uh, main structures compa uh, is usually composed of the two leaflets of, lipid, uh, of lipids. So that is why it's called bilayer. So, uh, I will show you in the next uh, few slides, I mean, that there is not, I mean, for the membrane, there is not necessarily to be two leaflets. But biological membranes always have uh, two leaflets. So, um, uh, so from spontaneously, uh, so they, they, uh, the membranes can form spontaneously in the aqueous solutions of lipids uh, and are stabilized by the several different uh, non-covalent forces, mainly no hydrophobic interactions. So, Proteins can span the lipid bilayer uh, of the membrane. So we will see what kind of different proteins can exist in the biomembranes. Uh, and very uh, interesting and important, so the biomembranes are usually asymmetric. So, uh, so we'll see that some lipids are found mainly on the inside leaflet, on the inner leaflet of the membrane, some other preferably on the outside leaflet of the membranes. So, and uh, the uh, carbohydrates or sugar moieties that are being attached to the uh, to, the, uh, to the lipids are always found on the outside of the cell, not inside. And that the membranes can be electrically polarized. So, uh, so being, like, uh, uh, being like this uh, membrane structures, I mean, they still retain some fluidity, which we're also going to talk about. So, and this is so-called two-dimensional solution, solution of oriented uh, lipids. Okay. Um, um, uh, so, so how's me, how does the membrane, I mean, what is the, let's say, chemical organization, chem, or physical chemical organization of the membrane? So the membranes are made of the lipids, as we talked about. So, and the lipids are amphipathic molecules, which have the polar or charged head group and a hydrophobic tail. So the lipids uh, uh, aggregate into uh, different types of structures in water. There are three main different structures that the lipids can, can self-organize into. Again, here we're not talking about actual biological membrane, we're just talking about some sort of experiment in the lab. So they can form micelles, bilayers, or liposomes. So, and, uh, so the type of structure that will be formed by any particular lipid will be determined based on the type of lipid or its uh, chemical structure and its concentration. For example, uh, micelles. Uh, so the micelle would be formed by the lipid uh, whose overall shape can be approximated by a cone. So, and, and when, this, uh, when this type of uh, uh, lipid, uh, lipids basically 
is uh, mixed with water, the self organizes into these structures called micelles, in which basically it's like little uh, spheres made of this uh, uh, conical uh, lipids. So, and this aggregation occurs when the concentration of molecule is higher than a certain threshold. That threshold is called critical micelle concentrations, uh, concentration or CMC. So in other words, when the concentration of, uh, so this number is different for any given lipid, uh, type of lipid molecule. So, uh, so when the concentration of the particular lipid in water reaches or becomes above that threshold, so they uh, spontaneously start to organize into these uh, micelle structures. Uh, so more, uh, let's say, uh, relevant to the topic of our today's uh, uh, lecture is the lipid bilayers. So, so lipid bilayers are usually formed by the uh, lipid molecules that uh, can be approximated more by like a cylindrical shape. So, uh, so that they have approximately the same cross section of the head as the tail. So the ones which were participating in micelle formation usually have larger head than uh, the larger cross section of the head compared to the cross section of the hydrophobic tail. So, uh, as you can guess from the uh, uh, from the name uh, bilayer, so it contains I mean two leaflets. So this is just a schematical diagram of what the lipid bilayer uh, looks like. So, and in this bilayer, so the hydrophilic head groups uh, interact with water outside and the hydrophobic, uh, hydrophobic tails of the lipid uh, uh, interact with each, with each other basically inside. Oops. Uh, okay. And this is basically like the closest model of the uh, uh, biological membrane, let's say plasma membrane. So, and now we can imagine if we will, uh, if we will, instead of talking about the uh, like infinite uh, flat uh, lipid bilayer, if we just curve it into a sphere, so we will get liposome. So, uh, so basically, uh, liposome, it's, uh, it's the uh, artificial uh, structure that we can make an experiment like in a test tube. Uh, but essentially, or topolog it, it, it's more literal to say that topologically, most of the, uh, most of the cellular membranes, like for example, membrane uh, around the vesicle inside the cell, right? Topologically, it, uh, it's the same as the is, is the same as liposome. So, so these are small uh, bilayers. Will uh, I mean, which spontaneously turn into spherical shape. So, liposome membranes can contain artificial inserted proteins. So, and liposomes um, actually do have some uh, connection with uh, uh, with drug delivery uh, in medicine. So that uh, so that some drugs, I mean, which uh, uh, will be degraded by the uh, human body, if, if administered directly, I mean, can be actually uh, uh, more, uh, can be delivered it in a more targeted way. So if they would be placed inside this little lumen inside the liposome. Okay, uh, let's talk about the dynamics of lipids in the uh, of the individual lipid molecules inside the membrane. So far, when I was showing you this structure, or that structure, so it it can make like a very erroneous impression that, I mean, uh, the structures are static. So in other words, I mean, so this lipid, lip, individual lipid molecule stays, stay where they are. So in reality, that's not true. So they, uh, they actually move very, very rapidly. So uh, one type of this motion, uh, it's called lateral diffusion. So lateral diffusion is just basically moving of the lipid molecule in the, in, in the, in the leaflet or within the leaflet. So and it occurs extremely fast. So basically, they exchange with each other uh, like at a very, very uh, high rate. So which simply means that um, this, although this membrane, um, it's a, uh, uh, I mean, it's a pretty stable structure, the individual lipid molecules always kind of uh, float. So um, uh, another type of motion in the lipid bilayer, it's a so-called flip-flop or uh, basically transition from one, uh, transition of the lipid from one leaflet to another. So this type of uh, motion happens very slowly. So unlike the lateral diffusion, which happens very fast, uh, uh, flip-flop happens very slowly. And you can guess why it happens very slowly. Because the polar, or in many cases, charged head group of this, uh, uh, of this uh, for example, glycerophospholipid, will need to cross the hydrophobic uh, 
inner part of the membrane, right? So this has extremely high activation energy. So basically, it's very hard to do it. Uh, so, so, the, uh, so the activation energy needs to be surmounted somehow. And uh, so this process actually uh, happens, in, uh, happens in actual membranes with the help of enzymes called flipases, so that they catalyze transverse diffusion of the lipids from one leaflet to another. And as I said, uh, so the, uh, the activation energy is very high for this reaction to occur spontaneously. Therefore, uh, so this, uh, uh, this type of transition needs to be, I mean, needs to, uh, to have supply of energy in the form of ATP. So this in enzymes called flip phases or flop phases, so they always use energy of ATP to allow this redistribution of the lipids between the, uh, between the uh, leaflets of the uh, uh, biological membrane. So, uh, and as we will see, the activity of these enzymes creates the asymmetric distribution of lipids between the two leaflets. In other words, the chemical composition or lipid composition of one leaflet, uh, in most in in the in, in the cases in most cases of biological membranes, uh, I mean they do not match. So basically, what the lipids that are present in the outside leaflet are different from the ones which are in the inside leaflet of the bilayer. And that uh, uh, brings us to the fluid mosaic model of biological membranes, which was proposed almost 50 years ago uh, at the University of California at San Diego. So, uh, so basically, we can treat a, a biological membrane almost like as an ocean. So ocean made of the lipids. So, but it's a two-dimensional ocean. So not a three-dimensional where you have depth, so it's just a two-dimensional. And the various protein molecules in these oceans are like uh, icebergs, basically, floating on its surface. So, and uh, as we can see, so there are different kinds of proteins, which we'll also talk about uh, later in, the, in the today's lecture. So there are uh, integral membrane proteins, the ones which span membrane uh, from uh, one side to another. So there are peripheral membrane proteins, which uh, somehow uh, which like uh, submerged into this uh, bilayer a little bit. And there are uh, uh, also like uh, some proteins which attach to the, uh, to the membrane uh, by means of uh, covalent bond to the lipid or um, to some other protein which in turn is connected to the membrane. Okay. Uh, a very important uh, feature of the biological membranes, which is actually utilized in many, in many functions in the organism, is the ability of the membranes to bud and to fuse. So in other words, uh, I mean, uh, uh, I know that with the uh, sort of foam bubbles, it's hard to imagine that, but imagine that you have like a big foam bubble and then you can sort of like take a little one out, right? It would be budding, or like if you had another bubble and merge them together, so it would be fusion, uh, basically. So, and the membrane is really uh, kind of prone to do, it, to do that. So it's like it's their uh, internal, uh, uh, the internal propensity to either merge together or to separate. So, and that is utilized in a variety of different functions, such as, for example, budding of vesicles from Golgi complex that I'm sure you studied in the cell bio course. Exocytosis or endocytosis. Oops. So exocytosis is when the uh, like the vesicles basically with some content have been uh, secreted, and endocytosis is when some nutrients, for example, have been engulfed into the, into the cell. So quite often entry of different viruses such as influenza uh, actually uh, has them in the stage when the, basically the whole viral particle is being kind of uh, 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 engulfed into the cell, I mean, through, the, through this... Uh, uh, through this endocytotic, endocytosis-like process. Okay, uh, release of neurotransmitters uh, at nerve synapses. So that's uh, uh, like a, basically an, ex an exocytosis type of process, but I mean, it's also very important. So uh, perhaps we won't be here if not for fertilization, which is due to the fusion of the membranes. So, and actually uh, exocytosis itself, it's also fusion of the membranes. Uh, so separation of two plasma membranes during the cell division. So during mitosis or meiosis, it's also uh, uh, basically largely owes to the, prop I mean, to the property of biological membranes, that is ability to 
uh, basically be separated or to be fused. Okay. Um, I'm not going go. I'm not going to go over d uh, in detail about like how this process happens. So we just to uh, sort of. I mean, uh, this is a figure from the textbook, but again, I'm, I don't want you to like really know the players here and what what's actually. Uh, I mean, happening. What is important is that quite often, for example, if you want the uh, vesicle, for example, containing neurotransmitter to be fused with a plasma membrane and release that trans uh, neurotransmitter. So you, can ri you cannot rely on a spontaneous process, right? Because you will be waiting for the million years for, that, for this uh, vesicle to decide, finally, to go to plasma membrane and do it. So you need to be proactive um, and uh, initiative. So, so and, 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 and that role belongs to the different proteins. So basically it's various proteins which mediate, I mean, that uh, coming close, I mean, then fusion of the two membranes and then release and so on and so on. So, uh, so the main uh, message from the slide that I want you to take home is that when this process is of either, uh, let's say, budding or fusion or membrane budding or membrane fusion are happening, so proteins, specially dedicated proteins, quite often mediate that. So they control that and, uh, and, 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 and make it happen when it's needed and not happen when it's not needed. Okay. Uh, composition of biomembranes. So uh, uh, as I said, so uh, membranes mainly are composed of the biological membranes are mainly composed of the two main components, lipids and proteins. So uh, the membranes that we started to uh, talk about here, right? So again, this is just uh, artificial experimental systems. I mean, so this is just lipids, basically. Uh, but uh, all membranes which surround the cell or inside the cell are always made of lipids and proteins. So where we were here. Um, so ratio of lipid to protein varies in different biomembranes. We'll see this. Uh, and type of the phospholipids varies in different biomembranes too. So an abundance uh, in type of sterile varies. Remember we talked last time that bacteria do not have cholesterol uh, and uh, which uh, uh, that bacteria do not, uh, do not have it. So, and the collect, uh, cholesterol is predominant is in the plasma membrane but is actually absent from mitochondria. So galactolipids or uh, glycolipid, I mean glycolipid type of uh, uh, components are abundant in the membrane of plant chloroplasts, but are almost absent in animals. So it's just some examples. By the way, speaking about the cholesterol, I completely forgot to mention about uh, the fact that uh, when we were talking about this flip-flop, right? So and the fact that uh, the flip-flop for most of the uh, phospholipids is actually have very high energy, I mean activation energy. So. Uh, uh, cholesterol has the smallest energy of flip-flop uh, transition. As a result, so the, you can now see what the function, I mean, one of the main functions of the cholesterol in the biological membrane. So imagine that, okay, so here's just a little portion of the biomembrane, right? So, but just uh, kind of uh, imagine that it's like becomes longer, right? So now it's flat. Uh, imagine what will happen if you need to bend it, right? So when you start bending it, so basically the, the distance between the head groups in the, let's say in, in this example in the upper part would be, I mean, become larger, larger, and the distance between them in the like innerly flat, so they would be compressed. So uh, as you can guess, I mean, the easiest solution, I mean, if you keep doing this and nothing happens, right, so it will break sooner or later. So and that's happening with the materials actually. Like uh, when you, when you, so if the material cannot, is not flexible, right, it just breaks. Okay, so what happens with the membrane? So if the uh, transition of the molecules from the inner leaflet to the outside leaflet would be easy, right? So you can quickly redistribute them so that these gaps forming on the outside part will be quickly filled with the molecules jumping from the inside. And that's exactly what the cholesterol is doing. So because it's a much smaller molecule than most of the phospholipids, and it has a tiny little group which is not even charged, I mean, as we remember, it's OH, right? So it can very quickly redistribute by itself without any flip phases. And as a result, the membrane has this flexibility. So because without this flexibility, the membrane would just break uh, like uh, even after very, very small deformation. So, so this is actually very uh, important, one of the very important functions of cholesterol in the biomembrane. Okay. Uh, here just showing you some numbers about like uh, 
what the uh, what are the different uh, 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 phospholipids? I mean, uh, li I mean, what are different lipids uh, in, in in various biological membranes? Uh, for example, pay attention to the content of the protein. For example, if we talk about bacteria like E. coli, it's like uh, uh, it's 75 percent of uh, protein and 25% of phospholipid and like 0% of cholesterol because E. coli is bacteria. So they don't have cholesterol. Um, so it uh, would be probably more appropriate to say that it's uh, like a membrane made of not lipids but of proteins with a little uh, lipid content in it. So, but animal membrane, I mean the, okay, uh, animal or plant membranes, I mean they have uh, progressively smaller and smaller content of protein and larger content of the phospholipids and uh, sterols. Uh, I mean, remember I mentioned like in the previous slide that the mitochondria do not have, uh, do not have the uh, uh, cholesterol in their membrane. Uh, doesn't it ring any bell? So, so those who took the bias like 100 course, probably you had this uh, endosymbiotic theory of origin of uh, eukaryotic cell, right? So you probably studied that. And as you remember, so the idea of the theory is that the mitochondria in the case of animal cell and mitochondria and chloroplast in the case of plant cell uh, were uh, sort of uh, wild, living or wild living organism back a couple, billion, uh, couple uh, of billions years ago, right? But then they were engulfed into some uh, precursor, right? Which became like the actual eukaryotic cell and sort of uh, continued living there and so on. And uh, I mean, of course, I mean, nobody knows for sure whether that happened or not, but there are lots of facts that speak to the uh, like very high probability that it could have happened actually. So, and this is actually one of those facts. We will see later that the mitochondria, uh, just like bacteria, have their own DNA, which is also circular, which is just like bacteria. Uh, so, and uh, like membrane composition. So bacteria do not have cholesterol, mitochondria do not have cholesterol. So another coincidence or not. Um, okay, uh, so sterols, I mean, and their derivatives in biomembranes. So, uh, so cell membranes of many eukaryotes contains the sterols. So these are cholesterol in animals, phytosterols in plants, and like ergosterol in fungi. So cell membranes of uh, aerobic prokaryotes contain uh, hopanols. So these are kind of uh, like an, uh, um, a co uh, these are compounds which are somewhat analogous to cholesterol but uh, made very differently. And as you can see, I mean, they have the uh, polar uh, side, I mean, on the completely opposite side of the molecule. Um, so, and, uh, so these molecules, the uh, the all cholesterol derivatives inside the membrane, so they increase membrane rigidity and permeability. So. Uh, we need to talk about the structures of biological membranes in archaea separately because uh, this group of uh, organisms is actually very special. So, uh, long time ago when they were first discovered, I mean, so they were called archaebacteria, but they have actually less in common with bacteria than they do have with eukaryotes. So that's why, I mean, nobody, uh, like for maybe for the last 10 or 15 years, calls them archaebacteria, so everybody calls them archaea. So, and uh, they're very special in terms of their membrane composition. Not all of them, but many. So, so as we remember, so most of the glycerophospholipid contain L-glycerol-free phosphate. So in archaea, there is D-glycerol-free phosphate. Uh, so uh, most of the uh, like normal uh, glycerophospholipids that we talked about last time uh, contain unbranched fatty acids. So, uh, these guys have branched isoprene chains in archaea. So, actually, so this is what means branched, right? So unbranched would be just zigzag. So, but branched means that some carbon atoms, I mean, stick to the side, or even more than just one uh, carbon atom. So uh, unique linkages of fatty acid to glycerol. So, uh, so when we were talking about the glycerophospholipids, we remember that the uh, fatty acids were esterified to the uh, to the alcohol groups, to the OHs, basically of the glycerol. So, and uh, here we talk about ether linkages in uh, uh, in archaea. So, ester is when you have CO, then O, then carbon continuous, right? So, an ether is when it's just through an oxygen atom. So, 
And uh, finally, I mean, so uh, archaea are very different in membrane topology. So, uh, so far we were talking about bilayers and some particular uh, archaea have monolayer topology of the membrane. So, I mean, this is just one of the examples. I mean, so example coming from this uh, archaea called sulfolabus sulfatarius. So that actually leaves at extremely acidic pH at very high temperatures. So you can imagine that actually at these temperatures and at this pH, so, uh, uh, so when you have a lipid bilayer, well, first of all, it will be uh, due to the thermal, mo thermal motion, it will be, um, it will have tendency to be separated, like even to individual leaflets. So one of the reasons why they have a monolayer just to keep it intact. So it's almost like tethered, uh, uh, it, uh, so this archaeal type of monolayer, it's like two tethered uh, leaflet of the regular uh, plasma membrane. So we can see this ether groups here, right? Uh, and also on this side. So there is no esters. So there is only ethers. So, uh, and as you can also, if you, if you will com uh, count the number of carbon units here, you will see that it's roughly double the number of carbons in each of the, uh, in, in the typical uh, C18 uh, fatty acid present in the phos uh, glycerophospholipids. So, which means that the thickness of this membrane is roughly the same or similar to what we have in bacteria. It just, it just uh, so you can arrive to the very similar structure using completely different chemical building blocks. Uh, okay, uh, I mentioned that the uh, composition of uh, lipid composition of membranes and various, and various uh, organelles is different. So, uh, and uh, and here just some uh, some data on that. So, for example, uh, see the plasma membrane contains uh, basically uh, cholesterol, phosphatidyl amine, phosphatidyl choline. So, uh, and, and I mean some other lipids as well, right? But depending on which membrane in the cell we're talking about, this composition can differ one way or another. So, okay, the main take home message from this slide is basically uh, what I don't want you to remember, I mean, well, it doesn't even show the percentages, of course, but what I want you to remember is that the, uh, the composition of the phospholipids in, in the particular cell, you take, for example, a liver cell, right? So the uh, composition of the nuclear membrane would be different from the plasma membrane, would be different from the endoplasmic reticulum, and so on. Uh, more to it, yeah, here's just some idea of where, where different uh, uh, lipids are present. So, so cholesterol, I mean, phosphatidyl ethanolamine, phosphatidyl serine are always present in the plasma membrane and uh, like various vesicles. Um, so next, uh, basically, uh, type of differences. So it's the fact that the bilayers are asymmetric. So asymmetric means that the uh, lipids present in the outside leaflet are different from the lipids present in the inside. For example, by analyzing this little uh, chart here, we can see that the phosphatidylcholine and uh, sphingomyelin so are mainly present uh, in the outside uh, portion of the membrane. So while all other, uh, I mean, uh, glycerophospholipids that we talked about last time are mainly present in the inside, uh, in the inside portion of the membrane. And uh, if I ask you, why is that? Yes. Uh, no, 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 not the biology, not, not, not the, I mean, how does the cell arrive to this? I mean, how does, I mean, uh, how you can end up with having different amounts of one lipid in one leaflet versus the other? Not why, not why the cell needs it, yeah. You close, I mean, it's activity of the enzyme. Lipases, exactly. So, so those enzymes, I mean, so they, I mean, that's, it's, another, it's another question actually. Why do, why do some cell need more phosphatidylcholine outside than the inside? So that's perhaps because phosphatidylcholine is positively charged, so the cell, cells really usually uh, maintain the negative charge inside, positive outside, but that mainly comes from the ions, not so much from the lipids. So, uh, but indeed, the cells are more, po are, most, are more positively charged outside than the inside. So, uh, uh, and this asymmetry is created by the activity of the uh, flip phases. Okay. Um, an interesting uh, 
feature, even with, uh, even with uh, let's say, all these numbers that I showed you in the previous slides, right, this is, uh, this is not constant. So organisms such as E. coli, for example, can quickly adjust their membrane composition based on the, uh, based on the conditions. So, and uh, the main reason for that, it's the fluidity of the membrane. So uh, because at high temperatures, cell need more saturated, well, basically at high temperatures, cell need to maintain the integrity of the membrane. And as a result, the, uh, the organism will uh, incorporate more saturated fatty acids in the, uh, for example, glycerophospholipids. At the low temperature, cell need uh, uh, to maintain fluidity of the membrane. In this case, there would be more unsaturated fatty acids. So uh, what I'm showing you in this table at the bottom is basically uh, just look at the redistribution of different types of fatty acids in the, glycer in the, phospho in the membrane phospholipids at, sorry, at different temperatures. So this is all in E. coli. So we go from 10 to 40. So uh, for example, uh, the first two are saturated. So if we increase the temperature, right, so uh, it goes from 18% to 48%. And at the, at the same time, the proportion of the uh, monounsaturated fatty acid goes drastically down. So basically almost the same number of fold as the, uh, as the saturated fatty acid go up, the same number of fold, the amount of the unsaturated uh, fatty acid goes down. Okay. Uh, so far we've been uh, talking about the lipids, right? And uh, as we can see, the main function of the lipids with a few exceptions is mainly structural, just to make the membrane as fluid as it needed in the given conditions. So, but, uh, uh, but lipids are not the only components of the membrane, so they're also proteins. And as we saw in the case of E. coli, there could be up to 75% uh, 75 of the membrane proteins uh, um, uh, as compared to only 25% of the, of the lipids. So what, are, what do those proteins do? Uh, so proteins can be receptors that detect signals from outside, such as hormones, neurotransmitters, pheromones, and even light. So, uh, so uh, they can be uh, channels, gates, and pumps. As you can guess, this type of proteins, it's the uh, ports of entry or exit of uh, molecules that are needed inside the cell and that uh, uh, needs to be kicked out uh, outside. Okay. So there are also membrane-associated enzymes. Uh, uh, I mean, obviously, the ones which synthesize the lipids themselves, and also uh, the ones, for example, which synthesize ATP using the proton gradient, so such as ATP synthase complex. So uh, let's talk more about the types of the uh, proteins in the biological membrane. So there are three topological types. So um, topological types means where they're located relative to the lipid bilayer. So, uh, so they could be peripheral, integral, and anchored. So, so peripheral, uh, peripheral proteins basically are the ones which are located at the periphery of the membrane. So, but what does this mean? So they are associated with the polar head groups uh, of membrane lipids, and they are relatively loosely associated with the membrane. So uh, uh, loosely means that they can, they can be removed from a membrane by disrupting ionic interactions either with high salt, wash, or changing the pH. So in other words, peripheral membrane proteins anchor on the, uh, basically on the, uh, on the edge of the membrane through the mainly ionic interactions with the polar head groups. So that is why by uh, washing such membrane with the high salt buffer, so you can uh, remove such proteins. Uh, so purified peripheral membrane proteins are no longer associated with any lipids. So in other words, these are the water soluble proteins, they do not have any hydrophobic, uh, well, they do, they may have hydrophobic amino acids, but the ones which are not exposed on the surface. And they do not use those patches of hydrophobic acids to bind to the lipid, uh, to, the, to the membrane. So, which is completely different from the peripheral membrane proteins. So, uh, okay. Sorry, from integral membrane proteins, of course. So the ones which span the entire membrane. So, so these, are the, uh, we, these are the proteins which basically go, uh, they kind of traverse the lipid bilayer. So, and uh, these proteins in many cases are asymmetric. So they have domains that are different in the inside and outside compartments. 
So these proteins are tightly associated with the membrane, and they cannot be removed by any uh, 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 sort of high salt washes, as in the case of this, as in the case of uh, uh, peripheral membrane proteins. So they can be removed from the membrane only by detergents. So detergents that disrupt the membrane, and in this case, these proteins always, uh, when, when they're purified from the membrane using the detergent, they always come with some amount of lipid. So these proteins, and we'll see, always have the hydrophobic patches of amino acids. So some, just some examples. Uh, for example, uh, like perhaps, I mean, the most well-studied, uh, uh, the most well-studied type of um, uh, transmembrane proteins would be uh, bacteria rhodopsin and the, uh, this, I mean, homologous proteins called GPCRs, G protein uh, coupled receptors. So, so they have seven transmembrane alpha helices which traverse the lipid bilayer. So, and uh, as you can guess, in order to get inside this lipid bilayer, they need to have uh, patches of hydrophobic amino acids which will be exposed and therefore, I mean, uh, stabilize the protein inside the membrane. Okay, so there are several types of how this uh, transmem uh, transmembrane integral proteins can be oriented relative to the membrane. So uh, we're not gonna go into details, but I mean, as you can guess, so there are several different ways. You can have N-terminus on one side, you can have N-terminus on the other side. So you can have one transmembrane alpha helix. So you can have several transmembrane alpha helices. So, uh, so you can have, let's say in this case, in uh, type five, I mean, you have several different polypeptide chains, while in type three, so you have the same polypeptide chain just going up and down. So uh, also the, uh, uh, these uh, integral membrane proteins can be anchored in the membrane through uh, some special, uh, uh, basically, fatty acid or uh, glycerophospholipid anchor. So um, an interesting, uh, mainly computational method that allows you uh, to predict whether the particular protein, protein is likely to be a membrane protein is a hydropathy plot. So, for example, you study the genome of some uh, unknown organism, or you even found a new gene in the human genome, and uh, all what you have is just a sequence of nucle uh, nucleotides, right? So you wanna uh, some, like, make some predictions. I mean, let's say that protein is not homologous to any of the known protein, uh, not the proteins, but the gene. So you can try to, uh, to get the sequence of the amino acids in that protein from the sequence of the gene, right? But what are you gonna do next? So one thing to see whether at least, I mean, it can be a membrane protein or a water-soluble protein is to run the hydropathy plot. It's just a plot where you uh, basically on, y -ax on x axis you put the residue number and on y axis the hyd uh, hyd uh, hydrophobicity index. So it's like basically how hydrophobic is the amino acid. And, it, and when you start seeing uh, something like this, right, so when, uh, when, when it basically regularly changes, I mean, from being extremely hydrophobic to being, to be hydrophilic, then extremely hydrophobic. So when you see something like that, you can say that, oh, it's very likely, I mean, that, uh, for example, this particular protein has seven transmembrane uh, segments. You cannot say whether they alpha helices or not, but if you see something like that, I mean, it's very likely that it would be uh, uh, homologous in structure to the uh, GPCR, so G protein coupled receptors that we're gonna talk next time, uh, or bacteria rhodopsin. Uh, okay, um, uh, so membrane proteins contain clusters of amino acids. We already talked about these hydrophobic clusters, right, which uh, need to be exposed into the inner part of the membrane. So they also have hydrophilic, uh, the clusters of hydrophilic amino acids, which would be uh, Hydrophilic, it's either polar or charged. So, uh, which would be exposed on the uh, either out, outside domain of the protein or the inside part of the protein. And interestingly, so for example, tryptophan residues are often clustered at the edge, right where the, uh, the protein molecule uh, basically faces both the membrane and the uh, uh, cytoplasm or extracellular matrix. So, um, Interestingly, the uh, way the, membrane, uh, the pro membrane proteins can be organized inside the membrane are not necessarily through the alpha helical uh, secondary structure, but also through the uh, uh, beta structures. 
For example, in other uh, beta strands can fold into so-called beta barrels. So these structures are called beta barrels because, I mean, uh, in this topological diagram, they look like a little barrel. So, and, and, and that is another way how, this, uh, how the membrane proteins can be organized in the membrane. So not necessarily alpha helices, but also could be beta strands. Uh, uh, so uh, finally, anchored membrane proteins. So some membrane proteins are lipoproteins. So in other words, they covalently link to some lipids. So, and contain a covalently uh, yeah, lipid molecule. So uh, it can be either long chain fatty acid or it can be some isoprenoid or sterol. Uh, or even glycosylated uh, phosphatidyl inositol or GPI anchor. So this is the most uh, uh, one of the one of the most common type of uh, anchors. I mean, in the uh, in the biological membranes. Uh, so anchoring of proteins to the membrane is a reversible process. It allows targeting of proteins to the membrane when needed and not targeting when not needed. Some anchors, such as GPI, again this one, uh, are found only in the outer face of the plasma membrane. So in this case you can actually have a relatively uh, hydrophilic protein, the one which does not have any transmembrane alpha helices or anything like that, to be tethered to the membrane. So we will see uh, in the next lecture when, we'll, when, we'll, uh, when we will talk about um, signaling so that uh, some uh, subunits of the G proteins are actually linked to the membrane exactly through this type of uh, anchors, so, so through the GPI anchor. So we will see that one of the subunits of the G protein uh, basically is tethered to the to the uh, uh, tethered to the membrane, and that allows it to much faster find the target because instead of traveling in the three dimensions, it will travel only in two dimensions of the uh, of the membrane. Okay, uh, this is just summary for this uh, uh, for the for this part. So. Every component of the membrane it exhibits, uh, exhibits a symmetry. So, uh, I mean, this is, I mean, like some uh, sort of a cumulative take-home message from many uh, slides. I mean, in this part of the lecture. So, in other words, so the uh, membranes of different organisms are different. The membranes inside different cell of the same organism are also different. The membranes in say, inside the same uh, the same cell are different. And even the leaflets of the same membrane have different compositions of the lipids. So, um, uh, membrane proteins. So, uh, so there are several different types. I mean, and uh, so there are peripheral and basically integral. So, and that's what I would like you to remember, that the peripheral uh, proteins are usually hydrophilic and interact with the membrane through ionic interactions. So, uh, ionic or some other hydrophilic interactions. So, and the uh, integral proteins are basically span or traverse completely the lipid bilayer, and they have patches of hydrophobic amino acids to uh, compensate for the hydrophobic nature inside the membrane. So, um, and that if the, uh, if the uh, uh, sugar is attached to the lipid, so that would be always on the outside of the cell. Okay, uh, speaking about the membranes, we cannot avoid uh, talking about the transport, because I mean, uh, besides protection, basically, and sensing of the signals, uh, so transport of various molecules across the membrane is one of the, mostly, uh, one of the most important functions of these uh, biological structures. So cell membranes are permeable to small non-polar molecules that passively diffuse through the membrane, such as water, for example. So the water can easily uh, get from one side of the membrane to the other. Uh, well, I mean, you may ask why. Well, first of all, it's because, well, water is not charged. It does have, it's a little polar, but it's not charged. So it, uh, uh, it can, uh, and uh, because, I mean, it's uh, also because it's very small molecule, it's just only one oxygen and two protons, I mean, so it's uh, the energy for basically uh, for being, the energy for a molecule for being inside the hydrophobic uh, lipid bilayer is relatively small, so the water can easily get through. So, but if the molecule that we talk about is charged, such as an ion, so that immediately becomes impermeable, the membrane becomes immediately impermeable. So the, any charged molecules cannot get through the membrane. So any uh, sort of small, uncharged, non-polar, I mean polar or non-polar can get. So, um, uh, so basically the molecules that are polar or charged and which are large need alternate paths to cross the membrane. 
So in transport across the membrane can be facilitated by proteins that provide an alternative diffusion path. So there are two uh, conceptually different types. They are transporters or permeases and channels. So, and uh, uh, transporters are also called pumps. So they have high specificity for the substrate. Uh, so they have substrate, uh, uh, they, they can be saturated with the substrate. So, uh, uh, and they have gates at either membrane face and can move substrate against the gradient. So uh, catalyzed transport at rates well below the limits of free diffusion. So uh, in other words, I mean, uh, this guy is somewhat similar to the enzymes. So, and there is ion channels. So uh, ion channels, they have some specificity for the ion substrate. They not, sub uh, not saturable. They have usually single gate and uh, ion move with electrochemical gradient. And uh, they allow uh, transmembrane movement of ions at rate approaching the limits of unhindered diffusion. Okay, making it simpler. Uh, basically, uh, channels, that's like just a passive opening, it's like a valve, right? Just imagine like, let's say, let's do imaginary physical experiment. So we have two chambers, like they're closed, I mean, they're connected by a pipe, right? So. Uh, Let's say if you have uh, pressure in one side and like vacuum in the other. So in, if, in, uh, if we'll just have a valve here, right? If we open the valve, the air will move from here to there, right? So that would be basically a passive diffusion from the zone of high pressure to the zone of low pressure until they will uh, reach the equilibrium. This is ion channels. So they basically just uh, relatively passive devices. The only thing is that let's say if in this valve we would make Let's say we will have some sort of a selectivity filter. In other words, only the molecules of oxygen will be allowed to get through, but not molecules of nitrogen, for example, that are also present in the air. So, but again, uh, the, um, uh, the energy for this transition comes from the differences in the pressures on these two sides, right? But not uh, from the fact that this valve was doing actually. So this valve is totally passive. It doesn't even have any motors or anything like that. Transporters, as you can guess, this is the opposite of that. It's like a pump. It's the one which have a little fan which will be uh, sort of, which, which can help move that gas from one side to another, but also it can actually make the vacuum on this side and pressurize that cylinder on the other side. So, uh, so this is the take home message that I want you to actually to comprehend. So the transporters versus channels. So uh, both transport can transport the same ions, right? So uh, channels transported based on the electrochemical gradients, so uh, and the pumps transported based on the energy energy source. So they need energy source. Uh, okay, let's just once again go with the types of transport. So the simple diffusion, it's a diffusion like of, for example, uh, uh, usually, uh, I mean the best example would be water molecules, right? So they don't. Uh, so this is diffusion across the lipid bilayer, across the membrane, without the help of any proteins, without any transporters, channels, whatever. So facilitated diffusion, it's the uh, same as this one, but it's for the molecules that, uh, uh, that basically cannot cross the lipid uh, uh, bilayer by themselves, for example, for ions, right? So, so facilitated diffusion is just this valve, I mean, like the opening, like a hole through which they can just... Uh, get through. But in this case, I mean, they go only down the electrochemical gradient. So they cannot, uh, I mean, the, uh, so they go from the zone of high concentration to the zone of low concentration. So, or from the zone of high charge to the zone of low charge. Okay. Uh, then there could be primary active transport. We'll talk in a second what the primary versus secondary active transport. So active transport is basically opposite of facilitated diffusion. So this is, it's, it's, uh, it's a type of transport when the molecules are moved against their electrochemical gradients. And in this sense, you need to, su to supply the energy to such transporter, so that would be the pump. So, uh, and uh, so the primary versus the secondary. Here, uh, so what is the difference between primary active transport and secondary? So primary uh, uses ATP, to directly move the substrate. For example, uh, the ATP, uh, um, uh, for example, proton pump. Proton pump uses the energy uh, of ATP to transport protons across the membrane. 
but uh, so, uh, like in the case of secondary transport, that proton gradient, which we already created on the membrane, can be used to transport some other ions or some molecules. Uh, such, uh, and, 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 and basically, this is just exchange of currencies. So, uh, so first you, I don't know, uh, like uh, change, uh, change uh, ATP to the proton gradient and then use proton gradient as a currency to exchange it for the, let's say, gradient of sodium ions or potassium ions. So that is the main difference between the, uh, uh, between the, uh, between the two uh, types of transport. Okay. Um, so the uh, different types of uh, membrane uh, transport systems can be either uniport as when one solute uh, goes from one side of the membrane to another. So the two different solutes can go together or they can go like in the anti-parallel directions. So, uh, so an interesting example of the transporter would be a uh, glucose transporter. So in this case, there are two gates. So the molecule binds on one side of the membrane, then the uh, transporter changes its conformation. That first chamber closes and then it gets out on the inside part. This is very similar to the decompression chamber on the International Space Station, basically. So like how the astronaut will get from inside to outside. So the same basic idea. So, so there are two gates, I mean, so, and, uh, and changes, and they never open at the same time. Okay, so, uh, yeah, these are the two types of reactive transport. And finally, I mean, the uh, uh, sort of the centerpiece of all uh, 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 of all transport systems, I mean, would be probably this ATP synthase complex. So uh, it's interesting because very similar molecules uh, are used for the opposite, uh, for the almost opposite purposes in different uh, tissues and different cells. Uh, 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 so the energy of ATP uh, can be used to drive protons through the membrane and, uh, and vice versa. So uh, the uh, proton gradient can be used to synthesize the ATP uh, basically in the membrane. Uh, so that, that first one is used by bacteria. They like to create a, a proton gradient on their plasma membrane, and then they use this proton gradient for, uh, uh, for various things. For example, for motion of their flagella, for example. Uh, on the other hand, uh, the uh, electron transport chain in the uh, inner membrane of the mitochondria operates exactly in this mode. So the, when the electron is basically being transferred from one carrier to the other, so uh, that is what you will actually study with Professor Jeffrey in the next, uh, in the next module. Uh, so as the electron is, be, is being transferred from one carrier to the other, the protons are being pumped from the inside of the uh, mitochondria into the, uh, in between the two membrane space. So, and then, so this ATP synthase complex essentially uh, allows, I mean, the protons to come in and ATP is being synthesized. So, uh, and that again illustrates the fact, I mean, uh, uh, like quite often almost, I mean, the same enzyme, I mean, the same molecule of enzyme can catalyze both reverse and the forward reactions. It's just depending on the equilibrium. So if there are uh, a lot of ATP, then it will be uh, pumping protons. If there are a lot of protons, then it will be making ATP. Okay, so what did we talk about today? So most of biomembranes are composed of lipid bilayers associated with a variety of integral, peripheral, uh, uh, and amphitropic proteins and glycoproteins. So in the fluid mosaic model, the membrane structure, both lipids and associated membrane proteins are able to diffuse laterally. So that's an idea. So like you, you treat this fluid mosaic model as just an ocean with icebergs sort of floating in it. And the only difference with the ocean is that it's like two-dimensional instead of three-dimensional. So, uh, so lipid distribution in the inner and outer membrane leaflets is asymmetric, and movement between the monolayers typically requires uh, basically help of the enzyme, so, which we know is called flipase. Um, uh, so however, for the cholesterol molecules, because they're small, so the energy of transfer, the energy of transfer from the uh, from one leaflet to the other is relatively low. As a result, they can quickly redistribute and provide this flexibility of the membrane. Uh, uh, so th from a biological standpoint, one of the very important features that the membranes have is the ability to merge, 
and to separate, to, uh, to basically to bud and to fuse. So which, uh, uh, which lies at the basis of many pro uh, important biological processes such as neurotransduction or fertilization or cell division. Uh, so uh, while the uh, lipids provide mainly the structural uh, uh, part, I mean, or, uh, constitute the structural uh, part of the membrane, so the proteins mediate the functions uh, associated with the membrane, such as exchange of the different uh, uh, metabolites from inside to outside, uh, as well as sense the different signals, so which we'll talk next time. And um, so these integral proteins that span both leaflets, uh, both leaflets of the, uh, of the lipid uh, bilayer, so they fa uh, facilitate active uh, and passive or passive transport, I mean, across the uh, cellular membrane. So uh, I would like you to remember these two different types of transporters. So the pumps and channels. Again, pumps are active, sort of, like just like regular pump, the one which can uh, pressurize the cylinder, like in our example with the two chambers. So, and the uh, channel is like a passive valve, which just allows, I mean, the gas to, uh, to actually passively go through the, from the high pressure to the low. Okay. Uh, that's it for today.